I enrolled at Stanford and I, I promised my mother I would apply to the three best law schools in the US, Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. And if I was accepted, I would not uh, take a job as a computer programmer. <laughs> and sure enough, that's what happened. And uh, I think it was a very, very good decision for me because it allowed me to come to Silicon Valley, which at the time was not someplace I knew being from the East Coast of the US. And once I was in Silicon Valley, I, I basically never left. So you know, when was it? Uh, uh, so you immediately joined the NVIDIA or you, you went to some, some other place first? So I, like I said, I'm probably a little bit older than I look. I'm, I'm on my third career now. So I joined a law firm named Wilson Sonsini. Okay. Alto. And uh, once I was there, I, I wanted to become one of the partners. So I stayed long enough to become the partner at the firm. And then uh, much to the dismay of my wife, uh, as soon as I had a very stable career, you know, I left. And um, mm -hmm. I first went to uh, Alta Vista, which was one of the original search engine companies and became their head of business development. That actually, that company was was destroyed basically by Google, which had a, mm -hmm. Alta Vista had a very, very good search algorithm. Google's was faster and um Alta Vista lost its footing. And so that didn't work out. And so I was a little bit, I mean, one of the things I'll talk about later is, you know, patience and resolve, believing and, you know, everyone fails, you know, everyone has setbacks. And sure enough, um, as that was failing, I got a call from uh, uh, someone at NVIDIA and I knew, I knew NVIDIA and uh, they said, hey, we, we're looking for somebody to, to lead our business development. And you're the perfect guy because you understand technology. We know you do. And you're also a lawyer. And we know you have experience. So I, um, I went to meet uh, this guy, Jensen Wong. Back then, didn't have the leather jacket. Just had a basic, uh, like a white shirt like me. No sport <laughs> guy, pair of jeans. Like these are reading glasses. I mean, he literally had a, a Coke bottle, the glasses, just, you know, look like a typical, you know, Silicon Valley nerd. Uh -huh. And we had, we had a long conversation about accelerated computing, uh, computer graphics. And we, we, we both agreed that the computer graphics belonged to all kinds of other places than just games. And we all agreed that, uh, Parallel computing was the wave of the future that, you know, single threaded processing on CPUs was eventually going to tap out. And, and that's, and so I said, again, to the dismay of my wife, who wanted me to go practice law because she wanted a stable, you know, she didn't like a risk taker. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, you know, I believe in this mission. I believe in this person. I believe in this team and turned out to be an excellent decision excellent excellent decision but not an easy not an easy one and mm -hmm. um, as we talk more i'll explain to you how many times nvidia looked like it was near death mm -hmm. so that was uh late 90s or 2001 2001, 2001 yeah uh, that's when uh, just uh, you know dot com collapse and uh, oh, 911 yeah. <laughs> right. That, that happened, that, you know. That's that, when I started a company in Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah, I remember where I was on 9-11, and I, I think I had either just talked to Jensen or was about to, and I figured there was no way. Uh, there was, you know, I figured I'd better go back and practice law. But sure mm -hmm. enough, you know, everything yeah. clicked. Yeah, I, I, I can understand, you know, the, that was really a time when uh, things are all... Uh, you know, collapsing and, uh, you know, people want to have a safe, safe place, but you, you chose a risky pass. And uh, yeah, because I believed because I, uh -huh. my, my logic and my intellect, well, well, first of all, having studied computer graphics at Brown and as a lawyer, I represented several early computer graphics companies. I, I really love computer graphics. It was in my DNA. So I immediately mm -hmm. loved NVIDIA, but uh, NVIDIA 
I knew NVIDIA, and by the way, there were about a thousand employees when I joined. Now there's, I think, 27,000, 30,000. There were probably about 22,000 when I left. But I knew fundamentally that parallel processing, like I knew that computer graphics was only the first killer application for accelerated computing. I didn't know what the second one and the third one was going to be, but I knew there would be more. And so that's why I placed a big bet, you know, because, you know, money is money, but time, your time is the most important thing. The opportunity cost of spending your time on something is all you have in, in your life is what, where do you focus your time? It's the most valuable thing because it, you can always make more money, you can lose money, but time just, you never get more of it. The time, you can never have that time back. So you have to choose the path that gives you the most opportunity at that time, what you believe. Yeah, that's a, that's a great piece of advice. And uh, for the people who don't know the Wilson Sonsini, it's uh, the uh, largest uh, law firm, a venture, venture law firm in Silicon Valley. And, uh, and he, he gave up uh, the safe position at the Wilson Sonsini. Um, now, uh, uh, so in the 2000, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, late 2000, maybe there was some uh, big shift in the in Silicon Valley. You know, uh, you know, Facebook uh, kind of uh, emerged, and Google also emerged. And uh, what what was Nvidia doing? I think the uh, uh, I think 2007, uh, Jensen Wang donated. Uh, I think 2007 or eight, uh, Jensen Wang donated uh, thirty million dollars to Stanford, and uh, you know now the the engineering school is named uh, after his his name, right? So that right. was a, that was a very good decision, I think. I think so. He he told me the story, and I think the um, the, the the building or the school was partially funded, but it, it wasn't fully funded, so. I, normally, I think you have to pay more than thirty million to get your name on it, but right. it, people were running out of money. So I think he came in with the last thirty million and became the donor of record. So I think it was a a very good decision, and he he's a very generous guy. But you asked me what was going on. You know, in two thousand and one, Nvidia was mainly a gaming. You know, Nvidia had built the original chip for the uh, Xbox at one point and was mainly a, a computer graphics company for gaming. We had just kind of entered the computer workstation market. So I believe Silicon Graphics was still around back then. And so mm -hmm. we decided, so was 3D Labs. And so we decided to enter the um, workstation market around that time. And essentially NVIDIA from below um, the cannibalized the entire a, a graphics workstation market with these you know, the graphics cards. But NVIDIA had a pretty good run, I believe, from around 2002 to 2007. The gaming business was going quite well. Um, you know, games, games have continued to grow. And um, I think by 2007, the stock had gone up quite a bit and we all felt pretty good about ourselves. Um, but that, that, was, that was the peak. I think 2007, mm -hmm. and while all this was going on, by the way, we were investing in um, high-performance computing and um, and uh, advanced computing because what 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 we started to do was we started to notice that professors and students like yours were using graphics processors to do very sophisticated cal calculations like um, fluid dynamics. Um, crash testing for cars, um, you know, smoke, you know, dispersion analysis, um, electromagnetic simulation. And they were basically programming in DirectX or OpenGL, which I'm sure mm -hmm. your students are familiar, which are kind of the languages people use for graphics. And they figured out how to do it. And they it, basically, they were trying to get supercomputing capability through graphics cards because that's, you know, you do what you have to do. And so my friend, David Kirk, who you may have heard of, he was the chief scientist in NVIDIA. He's now an advisor to GFT Ventures and an investor, very good friend. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. he, um, he started working on this thing called CUDA, Compute Unified Divide Ar Device Architecture, because NVIDIA's philosophy had always been to have an abstraction layer between the graphics card and the software. And the reason was so that the graphics cards could be forward and backward compatible with all software. So they, they, they started this from the beginning and they still believe it, that every graphics card will continue to work with every new uh, application game because we have this abstraction layer in between. And so it turned out and it, a beautiful strike because nobody wants to you know, buy a graphics card and then a game gets upgraded or a new game comes and it doesn't run. So NVIDIA had this huge software developer relations team. They eventually moved it to uh, Russia, which I think it's now moved, um, uh, I think it's Armenia. They, I think most of the people are out of Russia, but they were. this was really important. Software was really important. But what it meant was we started building this thing called CUDA, which was gonna allow you know, scientists, researchers, high performance computing experts to model their applications uh, using the GPU as an accelerator. And th this was a big investment because uh, it required not only changes to the hardware, but a lot, a lot of software. And it wasn't going well. It didn't go very well. I mean, it, there were very few applications other than, than games. And, you know, around 2008 or so, I think we, we hit a financial crisis, mm -hmm. if you remember. Yeah. Uh, everything crashed, right, in Silicon Valley, including NVIDIA. And um, at the same time that was happening, another another bet. So, so we had CUDA, we were investing in it, but no applications. Because mm -hmm. all these high-performance computing applications are very niche, very niche. Mm -hmm. Like, if you think of right. a company like Ansys, are you familiar with Ansys? You know, they do a lot of simulation, fluid dynamics. They have lots of different applications, but none of them are that big. So you, you'd have to go and you have to convince every one of these applications to write on top of the accelerator, which would make them go faster. But there are headwinds because there's a lot of work. And also the, the problem was a lot of these applications would actually sell less software if they were accelerated. Because if they sell by the, by the, by the minute or by the seat, you don't need as much software if it's faster. You, it's, 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 so there, there was always a disincentive to do it. So, so that, was, that was kind of a big problem um, at the time. And a lot of the investors in NVIDIA were saying that we should stop investing in this, that it wasn't worth it because there was no real, real killer application for, for CUDA. We should just focus on games. And so it wasn't a great time. And, you know, there was a real estate crisis. Um, nobody wanted to invest. Um, and then another thing happened, which was um, if you guys, you know, you, your students are not old enough to remember, but <laughs> you know, P P PCs used to have more than, you know, two chips, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. PCs used, there was one point where PCs, I think, had like 200 different semiconductor chips. And there were a couple of chips that were on there called the North Bridges and South Bridges. Mm -hmm. So now it's pretty much all integrated in the CPU, and then you have a discrete GPU hanging off a PCIe bus. But at one time, you know, all of the um, graphics and other, um, you know, input output was handled by, by either a North Bridge or the South Bridge. And, and video was in that business. It was called chipsets. And okay. we, were, we were making, we had about a billion dollars of revenue building chipsets. Uh, for both Intel and, and AMD um, computers. But, you know, Intel always was, was, wasn't was someone that liked NVIDIA because they viewed us as a threat. So Intel, you know, they control what was called the front side bus. I think it still mm -hmm. exists, which was the connection between the CPU and the chip that did all the IO, the South Bridge or the North Bridge. And so Intel decided one day that the front side bus was theirs. They were going to change the front side bus. It was no longer open architecture, thereby destroying, you know, Nvidia's billion dollar business. Now, when when your company is only doing maybe three or four billion dollar total revenue, uh, destroying a billion dollar business is huge. And so mm -hmm. this was really bad.
And so NVIDIA ended up in a lawsuit, I believe, with Intel. Somehow we, we negotiated it and they paid us uh, a royalty for, I, I forget exactly what happened, but there was a patent lawsuit. We said, you're infringing us. You're, but they eventually realized in order to get us to go away, they had to pay us. So we were out of it. All of a sudden, we're out of the chipset business. All right. Boom. Then, you know, here comes mobile computing, right? People forget, you know, there was a big, you know, obviously in Korea, Samsung is huge, you know, Apple is huge. Qualcomm. And so NVIDIA, we didn't want to be, you know, um, the food for, for the next, we didn't want to be like SGI. We didn't want to wow. get our business to rush. We thought mobile was going to be huge. So we said, we better get into mobile. So we started making some acquisitions. Now in, in hindsight, they look silly, but we bought a company called MediaQ. We bought a company called Portal Player, which was the original chips that went into the uh, Apple iPod. Um, we bought a modem company mm -hmm. and we started building this mobile business, but we realized pretty quickly that um, unless we had Samsung or Apple or one of the big phone companies as a customer, we were going to lose. So I think I just saw an article written. So tough decision. We got out of it, but these are all bad things happening. And stock is, mm -hmm. stock is down at that point. I think the companies may be worth, there were times, I think three to $4 billion, maybe, maybe less. Mm -hmm. I mean, now it's worth a trillion. So what's that? 300 times less. I mean, right. and think about it as an employee, you know, we, we had a layoff. Uh, and so we, we know Jensen is a great leader. We believe in him. We know where the vision is. And Jensen and I had many discussions like over lunch. Like, I used to sit next to him for a long time. And he's like, uh, Jeff, you know, we're going to be much more valuable than Intel one day. You know, it's mm -hmm. just a matter of time before Moore's law catches up with single thread processing. And we can talk about that too, Professor Cha, Moore's law. But mm -hmm. he said this and it just took much longer. So everything just took, I, I, I knew NVIDIA would end up where it did. It just took about twice or three times as long as I thought. Every, that, that, that's another lesson. Everything takes longer than you think. Everything in tech. Right, takes that's right, that's right. So <clears throat> I think uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, around that time, uh, late, uh, uh, I think around 20, 2008, and also, uh, Bill Daly also uh, joined uh, NVIDIA, right? Yeah so, yeah, so yeah, so Bill Daly is a friend of mine, and I'll tell you the Bill Daly story. So I'm not sure if I can say that, but Jensen asked me. I couldn't figure this out. So in about 2001, or two, when I joined the company, he said, uh, "Jeff, he goes, I want you to go visit Bill Daly at Stanford and go get him to join the company." And I'm thinking, well, why don't you call him? You know, you're, he's going to work for you. But and Bill and I became friends after that. But I, I was actually quite intimidated. In 2000, I think it was 2002, I went to, got to go to Bill. I think he was the chairman of, of the Stanford Computer Science Department at the time. So I was like, wow, I'm going to get to visit Bill Daly. And so here I am trying to convince him to join NVIDIA. And I don't know exactly why he didn't join at that time. And then David Kirk, who was uh, was the chief scientist at that time, he was trying to convince him. And then everything went cold, but I wasn't involved when he finally came in 2008, but we were so happy to have him. And uh, as he's he's a brilliant guy and I consider him a friend and uh, a great colleague. I, I actually miss him quite a lot because he, he and I work together on so many things and he's just such a, not only a brilliant technical mind, but a thoughtful thinker and he's 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 also started several companies it sounds like you have as well mm -hmm. um but i think his nvidia decision to come to nvidia was probably the best decision he made in his career yeah we invited him i think around four four years ago at snu and uh, we had a discussion so uh, a few hours uh, really uh, he's uh, yeah, I laugh because I just remember Jensen asking me to go hire him. And I, at that time, you know, he's he's a he's a very well-known figure. 
you know, I'm sure I'm an executive of the company, very, very senior, but I felt a little uh, weird, actually. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it was a, it was a, a negotiating tactic or <laughs> it, all, it all worked out. It all worked out. I mean, the, the NVIDIA's strengths is, uh, is not only, uh, you know, chips, hardware, but also on the software stack, you know, including, uh, I mean, CUDA played uh, uh, a big role in uh, establishing the, uh, you know, the, the, the unique strengths in the software areas. So how how did the CUDA took off, you know, the, and the, you, we're talking about, uh, you're talking about the two big banks, right? Uh, that happened in uh, uh, 20, 10 after 2010 right yeah yeah i think we announced cuda we were working on cuda for a long time i think we finally announced it in 2007 or 2008 and we had a big um compute we had our first big computing conference called envision and the problem with cuda was there were no applications you know a plat if your cuda is like a horizontal software platform and it's really hard to build horizontal platforms and technology. This is another big learning. Having invested in startups, work for NVIDIA, you can't, horizontal platforms are almost impossible because you have to have one or two applications, killer applications that allow you to fund the development. Because the problem in tech is you have to, you can't just keep spending money. Maybe in 2021, you can just spend money and there's free money, money, cost of capital is zero. But in normal times, there has to be a business flywheel that allows your business to take off. So CUDA was this horizontal platform. It was really good. And so we went out, like David Kirk wrote the book on CUDA. We went out and taught it in all the schools. We invest, we invest, and invest, but there's no return coming from it. All of our GPUs have CUDA enabled, but there's no application. So the equivalent GPU from NVIDIA costs more than the equivalent from AMD. Really bad. Investors hate it. They, 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 they come with knives, you know, they, they come in and they want to kill the company. They, they love the company, but they don't like CUDA. They don't like any of this accelerated computing talk or vision. You know, they say, just stop that. Don't invest and make us money and we'll be happy. So it wasn't, it wasn't a good time, but Eventually, you know, we got a little bit of high performance computing applications to take off, but still not that much. I mean, it was a fledgling HPC business, but the, the investment in CUDA, the platform, the ability to abstract out the GPU and to write in C like language for high performance computing application, super, super valuable. But you're waiting, what's going to be the killer application? What is it going to be? And, and here it comes, right? Your next question is probably where, where we're going with that, right? Right, right. So, uh, so finally, you know, this deep learning, uh, right? And uh, so just the NVIDIA is time. prepared, right? Just in the nick of time, I'll tell you. So, you know, I was at the company for 20 years. And so think about this, like, I started 2001, 2012, 2013. We start seeing, you know, the initial kind of rumblings of deep learning, maybe 2011, 2012. But, you know, as an employee, you know, I have, my, I have to feed my family. You know, I have my wife, you know, knocking on my head. Why are you doing this? Do you, why would you put all of your you know, career in this company, it's not going anywhere. A lot of employees leave, a lot of very highly paid executives of the company leave. They they probably, if they, if they haven't already done it, maybe they've thought about, you know, you know, sticking a knife in their own head. You know, I don't know. Like I, if I had left the company at that time, I would be very upset with myself, you know? And so, um, you know, but all of a sudden, you know, we see the bank, the first big bang of AI, you know, we start to see that, right? We start to see, we, we, we're, we're all, by the way, I'm sure you were working on it too at, at the university. Everyone's talking about computer vision, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to design a self-driving car and we're going to hand tune every algorithm 
and we're going to write a billion lines of code. We're going to get people in India or China or wherever labor's cheap. Just write us a billion lines of code and we're going to make a car drive itself. Or we're going to recognize dogs and cats by writing, you know, and so this is what people do. They compete, right? I'm sure you're, mm -hmm. you had teams that competed in ImageNet, but finally somebody shows up with a convolutional neural net, right? I think it's 2012. And they blow everyone away at Stanford's ImageNet competition. It's called the AlexNet, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, these, these professors and scientists who probably were told the same thing by their wives and families that I was. Why are you, <laughs> wasting, why are you wasting your time with AI? Like, I, I studied AI at Brown, too. I took those courses. But nobody tried to do anything because there wasn't a computer fast enough to basically train a convolutional neural net in less than, you know, a hundred years, you know, you could, you'd put your best computer on the job for a hundred years and it still wouldn't make it. And so all of a sudden somebody realized, okay, you know, NVIDIA's GPUs are getting two to four times faster every year. Okay. Now we can actually train some, a neural net and, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to finally show the world. And that, that's it. And I think it's, it's either 2012 or 2013. I think it's 2000, uh, 13, if I'm not mistaken, it's, I, I'm not, I, don't quote me on that. When we first see like the big, the first big bang of AI, I call it. And, you know, we get pretty excited at NVIDIA, but still nobody's really doing anything with it. It's still pretty early. There's no data center. There's no data center in the world where you can find a GPU. I mean, we're talking about data centers. No, nobody in their right mind is going to stick a, D, a GPU in their data center because you know why? There's no application, there's no software, there's no application. You don't, nobody buys hardware where there's no software. This is kind of the, this is the Apple mentality. Like this is why Apple is so powerful. Mm -hmm. they, they built all the, they built the app store and everyone built the software and then the hardware is, is, it makes it. But it's this flywheel that you need to create. You first need applications. And so this is what I was doing. Like this was, this was my biggest contribution, I believe, to NVIDIA. And I, I believe Jensen acknowledged that. It wasn't all the investments I made. It wasn't the acquisitions. I started in about 2008 to go find applications for CUDA. I put contests together. Mm -hmm. I talked to every VC that I know. I brought in hundreds of startups to present. I said, we're looking, we're going to help you if you program on CUDA. And there wasn't much AI. There were initial companies that looked like they were fooling around with GPU accelerated databases and so forth using CUDA. But I was on a mission and 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 this is this is this ended up turning into what we call the NVIDIA Inception program eventually. I think that's a great uh great move. And uh you know at that time I was also uh in the industry developing SAP HANA. So you know um you know around even uh, uh 2012, uh, the, the DRAM industry was also focused on the mobile DRAMs, yeah. not on the enterprise, you know, the data center DRAMs. So, you know, now the industry has completely shifted to, uh, since then. So, right. so now then, uh, you know, the, the NVIDIA took off uh, for, the for the last decade. Uh, what kind of... Uh, uh, challenges uh, or kind of a success stories that can you share? Uh, well, it wasn't it wasn't all good. I mean, mm -hmm. the first applications were all computer vision, but I think there was always some skepticism on what are you going to use the computer vision for. So, a big application was face recognition, and there was a lot of controversy around you know privacy and things like that. Obviously, self driving cars. This was kind of maybe number one where people felt like AI could be the 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 the, the, the answer to self driving. I think we're still waiting because we didn't realize like how hard that was going to be. Like how you know the AI was just it was it's better than most drivers, but it, it's still not completely safe. So, mm -hmm. but I think about 2015 is when you start to see Nvidia start to gain momentum and visibility and you know not only is the the, the computer graphics uh, doing well but the ai but here here's another thing that happened though like ai contributed to computer graphics because um 
there were there's been a, a complete shift from raster graphics to ray tracing graphics over the last you know seven eight years right before maybe 2015 2016 nobody thought you could build a ray trace and I, I assume your students know the difference between ray trace and rasterization but I'm I'm happy to explain that if you want yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. They know not that. everyone is familiar with that oh they're not yeah. yeah so the way we did computer graphics in the beginning was what's called rasterization which is you run a bunch of you know you you compute where the where the objects are using 3D matrix operations really this is where this is where AI and graphics collide is there's a lot of matrix math involved in both and mm -hmm. moving around 3D objects involves a lot of sophisticated math so you have these ma these these basically these processors and these GPUs that do matrix math which is exactly what you do with uh, AI processing and so um a lot of graphics is just approximated. It's not real. It's just you do the best you can and you you write all kinds of codes and algorithms, shaders to do everything. And it's just an approximation. It, it's, it doesn't have real, you know, global illumination lighting. So there was always a big gap between the kind of graphics you'd see in a game and the kind you'd see in a movie, you know computer journey. And the reason why the movies could 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 do it much better is because they used something called ray tracing, which is you actually use the laws of physics to trace the rays of light all the way back from and to the light sources that are illuminating. Because so it's, it's that last layer, like if you look behind me, you see a little shadowing. These are, if I was, if if this is a real background that you see here, and it looks real because there's shadows, there's nuances, and in a movie, you know, it used to take like a day, you know, or hours to 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 render basically one mm -hmm. frame, so you could do it beautiful. And then that process of Pixar or whoever was doing it could take months. So these were these were certain. And and video was very big into the rendering, you know, a software business too. We actually bought a few companies to do that. We believe that was really important. But the holy grail was to be able to do global illumination in real time, you know ray trace graphics on a pc and ai is actually the trigger that helps you do that because the way that nvidia rtx works is it it traces some of the rays but it approximates the others using ai mm -hmm. and so they're very very interrelated and this is what's going to eventually power the metaverse and because it's not just graphics it's ai all together. So this, this is why NVIDIA is so, so well positioned. Um, but anyway, I, 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 no, I'm, I'm forgetting the question you asked me, but I hope I just answered it. No, I think it, that's a good enough. So now let's switch it to uh, the uh, the current hype on the ChatGPT, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, large language models. So where do you see we are going? So who's the winner so far? Well, so first NVIDIA. of all, NVIDIA for sure. Like my my thesis, and I'll tell all this to my investors and my startups is, um, you know, the world is now moving from a code driven world to a data driven world, right? And so, if you think about it, there's code, there's compute, and there's data. In the past, you know, you try to drive a self driving car, program it, billions of lines of coding going on wherever. You know, I've been all through every country in the world. U.S. is very expensive, but in many countries in Asia, India, coding is cheap. People just code all day long. Now we're moving to a world where data can do the programming. We can recognize patterns from data to come up with algorithms. So what used to be coding and all the money that was spent on coding is now shifting to money being spent on compute and data. So finding data, labeling data, cleaning data and then compute. So if you think about it, NVIDIA is the only compute right now, really, that's powerful enough and mature enough to do this. So billions and trillions of dollars, remember, of coding costs are now shifting to the other side. And so that's why NVIDIA has become such a huge beneficiary of it, because it's taking the place of coders. Now, there's still a big data component, and NVIDIA needs to figure that out too. But they're doing a pretty good job because um, what they realized was um, 
the, the, the computation of the data is important, but so is the movement of the data and the storage of the data, because all, all these complex supercomputers, there's not one chip is not powerful enough to train these huge, you know, trillion parameter networks in semi, you know, reasonable period of time. You need multiple GPUs on one uh, server, multiple servers in one data center, and they all have to talk to each other because the data is moving around. So that's why NVIDIA is now in the high-speed interconnect business, data center business. That's why we bought Mellanox. When I was at NVIDIA, mm -hmm. we bought, this was like a big deal, I think, huge deal. And I know AMD's done something similar, but I don't think anybody has anything close to the, you know, full stack of um, NVIDIA um, for, for this. So, so that's kind of where I see that. And then you had asked me about ChatGPT, where I see that. Well, here's my take. By the way, do you have another question or should I just keep going? No, go ahead. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so chat, by the way, I'm telling you guys, er, everything I'm saying is just fully transparent. So you, you have all my secrets now. So may, maybe, by the way, maybe we can tape this because uh, I think it's being taped. I would love to see the replay. I think, I think it's being taped. So yeah, uh, yeah we can edit everything. and then uh, release. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm giving away everything that mm -hmm. I know. But the, the thing is, Thank everything you. I'm saying, everything I'm saying, I think is fairly simple, right? But it's the pattern recognition of seeing it develop over the many years, that's hard. Like not everybody's able to kind of see where, why and where. But, you know, the, 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 the computer vision, I, I believe computer vision, that was the first big bang of AI. I always believed that natural language processing was gonna be the next thing, conversational AI. And I think, by the way, I, don't, I think we're still not there. And, you know, Google, you know, they open sourced their BERT models um, as early as I think 2018, 17, 18. They gave it away. And so Google mm -hmm. had the technology, which I don't think is extremely complicated, these large language models. I think the big challenge is having enough compute resource and having enough data to go program. Mm -hmm. And I think some, some will say Google didn't pursue them because they were afraid of them. They didn't, or some would say they didn't know if they were accurate, or some would say they didn't want to cannibalize their search business. I'm not really sure. So it took OpenAI to finally, you know, put this in a commercial manner where not only were they reasonably accurate, but where it's really the, the prompt engineering that was difficult to deal with, like figuring out when I give a query, how to, you know, communicate it to the um, neural network so that the inferencing could find the right response. And I think that was a big innovation, you know, in the last year for ChatGPT3 and ChatGPT4. So, so I think, you know, it's definitely real. What people don't realize is, um, you know, ChatGPT, it's, it's, it's a language model. It's not a knowledge model, right? Like, mm -hmm. like it doesn't really know anything. All, all it's really doing is recognizing patterns of all the words, you know, that have been written or spoken, you know, over some period of time and basically regurgitating what it thinks is the most likely pattern that, you know, answers the query that you've put to it. So the prop, so the prop, so that's, I think it's amazing, by the way. I think it's, it's just an amazing thing. And you can only build these generalized AI, AI models if you have a lot of money. So that's why no startup really was doing it. Now they're, now they're trying. But the problem with it is it's not a knowledge model. Mm -hmm. And so I think people are forgetting that it's not ground truth. It's just, it, in, in, in some sense, it's hallucination, but it's good hallucination because as a starting point for an essay or a letter, you know, if you're talking about generative AI for, you know, imaging, it, movie, it's quite good, but it's, it's still not to the point where it's real, you know? And so I believe that all these uh, models are great inputs, you know, beginning inputs, but are going to need to be paired with, you know, knowledge models, which mm -hmm. already exist, but they're more complicated and there are lots of different types. I think they'll be need to be paired with 
multimodal imaging and facial models because it's not just what I say, it's how I say it and my facial expression. So I think it's very, very real. I think it's it's going to cause a huge, it's already causing a huge boom in computing. I think the big companies will be the biggest uh, beneficiaries of this. And I, I don't, but I don't think it's going to be a high, it's going to be a high volume business, but it's probably not going to be a high margin business at the end of the day, because it's some a commodity if you have enough compute uh, mm -hmm. and enough data. It, there's not a lot of real innovation. And then it'll be startup companies and other companies who have vertical expertise and compare it with the knowledge models that'll turn it into real products. That that That's my uh, 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 view. And the beneficiaries will likely be large cloud service providers, you know, who provide the compute for it. It'll be NVIDIA and whoever else figures out how to get into the AI business. Um, and it'll probably be the, the largest companies who have distribution for the applications that people will want to use it for, like Microsoft and Google, you know, maybe yeah. Apple. Like Apple, I think, doesn't really have it because, you know, Microsoft has their Windows 365 or whatever they're calling it. You know, um, Google has, you know, Google Google Docs and all the other things. So they, they like, what, where I want to use ChatGPT is I want to use it as part of my email. Hey, help me uh, mm -hmm. write this email to Professor Cha, thanking him for having me, you know, based on everything you know, it's in my email, boom, you know. So that, that, that's where I think it's going to go, but it's still developing. And I, I, think it, I think it's great for the ecosystem, but it's not, it's not the last thing we're going to see. It's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, so as of, you started the venture capital, you know, and so what kind of uh, uh, the, you know, the startups you, you like to see, you know, and, uh, and, and then, you know, but this, this could be a, a great tip to students and the professors who are uh, interested in doing uh, startups. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if people ask me like, um, why why did you start this fund like um and i i joked with someone today i'm om almost famous like i was the guy that i left nvidia i did 20 years i helped build it and then i left at the chat gpt moment why why would i do that but i mean the good the good news is uh, i'm still I'm, I'm still a stockholder i i I'm, I'm very happy to see nvidia do well because i do well so i fully mm -hmm. aligned with nvidia but i felt like the big wave of AI was just starting. And I wanted to, um, I felt like startups are gonna lead the way for many, many years. Here. And so the amount of innovation is gonna be incredible. And I'd done what I could do for NVIDIA. I'm sure I could have done a lot more, but I felt really good about my contribution. And so when my good friend, I think he, he might've been your student, Jay Yum, my partner, he, uh, he, he came to me and said, Jeff, let's start this fund. I know you understand this better than anyone else. So that's what we did. And so we, we look for companies that are fairly early stage and that are solving really hard problems for very large markets. We, we have invested in a Korean company, actually. They're, they're a U.S. company, but based in Korea called Mars Auto. I think you I introduced you to the founder. Right, right. Yeah. But Generally, we invest right now uh, in the U.S., uh, North America, and uh, Israel, but we're we're not averse to investing in Korea. We just we can't be everywhere right now, and we look for companies solving really hard problems for for very large markets, and in particular in AI. We we're not you know I believe a lot of the the technology is now open source, like including you know large language models, you know Google's BERT models. It's more about the data that they have and the ability to create more data. And it's about the people and their, their expertise in the vertical or, or application. So I'm more focused on data than I am on compute, to be honest. I, I believe compute, it's not that I don't like NVIDIA. I love NVIDIA. Most of the companies that do AI are gonna use uh, NVIDIA for training. Probably almost all of them will use them for inferencing right now, but some some will some will inference. You know, some some don't need that kind of horsepower. They'll be on the edge. But I'm mostly interested in uh, software applications, vertically specific applications that can disrupt entire markets using AI. And because I've seen so many companies, there's even though I don't know every vertical 
I mean, I've worked in many of them, but there's common themes, which is proprietary access to data and the ability to create and gather more data and get a, basically a flywheel effect over the competition that I think is is pretty powerful. So that and 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 great management teams, you know, either people that have done something before or people with extremely good recommendations who, who we get to know, who we think are very resilient. And I'll make I'll make one more point about resilience. So so you know, Nvidia, like like I believe persistence, patience, resolve, resilience. You know, the, these are the uh, these are the lessons of business. And my experience at NVIDIA is it didn't go well for a long time. I mean, <laughs> it really didn't. I'm just telling you. I mean, there were times I just wasn't sure. You know, I, 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 I mean, I always believed in the mission, but it, there's, there's so many setbacks and it happens with startups all the time. So the question is like, if you do something you believe in, we we need to find founders that we we know they're going to get knocked down. We just want to find people that are going to always get back up because you know the, the, there was a movie I watched recently where the guy was a fighter. He was he was a fighter and he turned into a, a Catholic priest and he was explaining something to somebody. Not sure exactly why that happened. Mark Mark Wahlberg and he said. You know, when you, you don't lose the fight because you get knocked down in boxing, right? You you only lose the fight when you fail to get back up. Mm -hmm. And so, like, starting a company, working for any of these deep tech, you know, far advanced companies requires a lot of patience and belief. Now, if you don't believe it, you, if you really believe it, then you do it. If you mm -hmm. don't really believe it, then you get out. You get out. But... Mm -hmm. We always believed, I always believed, and, you know, having a guy like Jensen Wong, who always believed, like, if he didn't believe at any point, he certainly didn't let anybody know. I don't know who he, okay. he talked to his pillow at night and go, man, I'm, I'm really worried, but I don't think so. I think the entrepreneurial mind is one that, you know, believes, and some people are really great at that. He, he's, he's the best in the world. You know, some people like me are great, you know, lieutenants who can execute and share, take the vision and, and move it into different ways. And, and I'd like to think, you know, I showed a lot of creativity by starting the startup programs and things at NVIDIA, but, but, but someone like me is very good at like, you know, analyzing talent, spotting talent. And that's why I'm good as a VC, which is essentially my third career, basically, right? Mm -hmm. We went through vehicle career, NVIDIA career, and, and, and this is my, this is number three. And so, I've bet the farm three times now, you know, law career, bet the farm on NVIDIA. Now I'm, I'm basically doing it again. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank you very much for sharing your, your thought and uh, also giving advice uh, to the audience. Now, uh, I think uh, it's time for us to, to switch to uh, Q&A. If anyone, by the way, uh, the Jeff is, uh, I heard there is a boxer. You right? <laughs> you, you like boxing, right? So you like fighting. <laughs> so no, I'm not, not very lose. good at it. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at it. So uh -huh. my partner Jay and I, we used to work out in a boxing gym together. That's how we got to know each other. He didn't. He didn't do the sparring, but I was in a group, and uh, I don't recommend it um, uh -huh. if, unless you're very, very good, because um, everybody, everybody gets hit. Like I, I don't know. You know who Mike Tyson is. <laughs> Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And so I don't care how much gear you have on, you if you get hit, it's not good. So uh the, and if you're not a good if you I'm pretty good, but because everyone else is much better than me, I mean, very few, you know, executives from tech companies get in the ring. So, you know, mm -hmm. most of the guys are kind of, you know, just work with their hands or they this is what they do for a living. So it, it, it's definitely helpful for, you know, mental, you know, acuity, but it's probably counteracted by the punches in the head. So maybe that. <laughs> okay. Now, Professor, you uh, you turned on your screen. So uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving your time and sharing 
your wonderful experience with Korean audiences. I very much appreciate it. I have kept saying killer applications. So I heard it, I think, more than three times or four times, killer applications. Um, so first question is, uh, what kind of killer applications would you would like to suggest to young Korean students? That's my first question. And second one is, you also mentioned that uh, nowadays it's data-driven rather than code-driven. I cannot agree more with you. Uh, so. In terms of big data, the area where AI has been successful is uh, image recognition and large language models. If I think why, then because of big data. So in the case of images, what you see is what you get as the big data. And in the case of large language models, what's written, so what you see as a text becomes your data, what you get. Uh, in other areas, if the data are more sensitive and more valuable and important other than images and text, then privacy issues might be uh, a, a problem which you have to address. So how do you think about this privacy issue in collecting more valuable big data in other areas other than uh, pure images or text? So that's my second question. And again, I appreciate your wonderful talk. Thank you. So you said some things which were really insightful there, and I agree with almost everything because I believe the first big bang of AI was image recognition, image net. The second big, big bang was conversational. The third big bang is going to have to do with data because the difference between voice and image is it's more structured. You kind of know how to label it. You know how to deal with it. Unstructured data is a bigger problem. So we're investing in a lot of companies that sort data, clean data, organize data. And so I think as if I was looking at like problems to solve, it's storing data, labeling data, privacy of data, you know, IP rights around data. These are all really interesting problems, but these, these would be some of the killer apps that are coming. Now, if you look at just GPUs, what we what we talked about in NVIDIA was the first killer app was GP for GPU was was uh, graphics. The second killer app was was AI. Right now, there's going to be now going to be various forms of AI. We just talked about, but I guarantee you, you know, large language models are not the last new type of AI framework that becomes really popular. Like I'm looking at people doing graph analytics frameworks you know, finding connections between objects and events. That's interesting to me, but it all revolves around data. So if I knew, if I knew exactly what it was going to be, I, I would tell you, but I, I really don't know. I mean, it's, it, but it's going to happen. And I think what happened with ChatGPT is going to happen with new forms of frameworks, you know, AI frameworks, even faster and faster, because now we, we, know, we have a business model and now, if you listen to NVIDIA, they're going to start populating data centers all with GPUs. So it's, again, it's like this platform, horizontal platform flywheel. The more applications you have, you know, the more hardware you sell. The more hardware you have, the more developers step in and develop more applications. And then people buy more hardware. So now that the, the, this is why Jensen Wong was talking about this. This is a huge inflection point. It's not every data center is going to have main, it's going to be at least half GPU, half CPU now. And when that happens, every developer around the world is going to have some platform because you guys probably know this, but there's not enough compute resource to train some of the models that people are working on. Like I've talked to the people in the NVIDIA research group. They complain that they don't get access to enough. They, they work for NVIDIA. Because, you know, scheduling these jobs, I mean, these are massive, massive jobs. So I think we're just seeing the start of it. And that's why I'm in the venture vein. I'm looking for those next applications. But in the meantime, there's going to be plenty of business models around, you know, large language models, you know, taking them, building uh, knowledge models. The, the other thing I'll think about, too, is um, multimodal AI. Like, 
why is it that I just see and look for vision? Why is it I just do conversational AI? Why don't these things get combined? Like we're we're just siloed right now. And so there's so much more. Like when you talk to me, you know, you don't just look, listen to what I'm saying. You look at my face, my expression, my gesture. Am I truthful? Am I not truthful? It's more than just two, you know, word documents, you know, going back and forth with each other, right? So I think there's so much innovation. Like it just, it actually boggles my mind, like how many problems are going to need to get solved. And so you guys can disagree. I mean, I'd be interested in your view, Professor Trump. I believe this is the biggest inflection point in technology we've ever seen by far, because this is the first time when things can move exponentially because we, mm -hmm. it's not limited by human hands, right? Mm -hmm. it's limited. The machine does the coding and the data. So as long as we can find ways to get the data in and the compute, we're going to see more innovation. So that's why I go back to data. You know, how do you get all the data? How do you sort, train, label, clean? You, like, though, we, we've invested in already a couple companies doing that. And I, mm -hmm. I actually think from a protective standpoint of IP and, you know, building a moat, you know, figuring out how to deal with data may be more, more valuable than um, just building the next, you know, AI algorithm. Everyone's got that, right? I, I, I fully agree with you. And, and in fact, uh, I mean, having, uh, having worked on uh, 40 years on data, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And also uh, learned from the uh, my uh, PhD advisor, you know, who worked on this problem more than, more than longer than I that I that I lived, and so I, I fully agree. And uh, uh, the essentially this is the data management problem, you know. And uh, this is uh, what I see. Yeah, this like yeah. I'm sure you guys are all much smarter than me, much better coders than me, much better technologists than me. I just have the benefits of recognizing the pattern over many years. I, I, I'm, I'm the beneficiary of like living through this and building it. So luckily I'm very good at learning things. So I'm listening and learning. Right. So that, that's where my, like, it doesn't matter how smart you are. You have to read the signs. You have to understand where the trends are going. And it's usually big things, you know, Big things and so if you get caught in too deep in the weeds you'll miss you have to kind of look at just what we're talking about what's the next big thing it's data data right we don't know how to deal with it you know so the, I, I can share one problem that i'm uh, uh facing at the moment uh, uh you know the career has a uh, you know probably number one in, in in the world in shipbuilding and uh you know, the uh, big shipbuilding companies have a uh, you know huge data, you know, history of uh, uh, designing ships. But the problem with these guys is they don't know AI. They don't have people. <laughs> but they, they, are, they are reluctant to release the data to the people or to startups who are really, uh, you know, interested in the data to innovate. So that's a, that's a dilemma. You know, I mean, I'm also advising one startup on this. And so, you know, what is your device? You know, I mean, there are, this situation is everywhere. So what is your device? Well, I think every company is going to have to become an AI company to some extent. Like every company became an internet company. Like I'm saying I'm a VC and I invest in frontier tech, global frontier technology ventures. Our focus right now is AI and data science. But eventually that every company will just, if you're not using AI, so they're either going to have to um, hire their own people to do AI, which is really hard right now because we're just graduating students who understand this, or they're going to have to build some trusted relationship with a consultancy or or some, somebody like that who understands your business. But that's the key thing. It's, you know, if someone doesn't understand your business, they can't really help you with AI, right? And that that's why the vertical expertise. So I don't know, like there are just certain industries like that where you know, it's maybe somebody has to start their own shipbuilding company from scratch that uses AI, right? Just 
that eventually the, someone will figure that out. Like that eventually happens and because it's just too hard for incumbents to uh, destroy their existing business. So I think those are two possibilities. Um, it's like, uh, this is what happened to, uh, you know, Kodak, right? Mm -hmm. Digital camera. When you say data, data has a domain knowledge embedded. So, yeah. uh, so the, the, the domain expertise plays a key role. Yeah. Yeah. So I think cross-functional like studies is really important, like computational biologists or mm -hmm. you know, computational engine, you know, mechanical engineering. You know, I think we're going to start to see universities build these interdisciplinary programs where everybody is going to have to understand AI. And I think we'll be able to do it like. Because of generative AI, I don't think everyone's going to need to be a programmer. I think we're going to be able to interactively tell our expert systems what we want and have it, by and large, generate the coding. I think once we get to that point, and we we, we are getting to that point with, with design of images, right? I mean, this is what DALI does, right? You basically say, hey, I want a picture of a, you know, a big building with a lot of flowers around it, you know, and, you know, it can do it for you. You can interactively tell it. So hopefully we'll get to that point. But that's why there's so much left to do, because that, it doesn't make sense that every business isn't disrupted by AI. Everything, right? It's going to it's going to have efficiencies. So now we, we are running out of time. So we'll take the probably one or two questions. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, raise hands or you know turn on the screen. Uh, go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, Mr. Hurst, thank you so much for the great introduction to the the two big things surrounding the AI and data science. I'm currently a part of a Professor Cha's uh, school as a graduate school student, and I was wondering if you are looking to hire a fresh graduate student um, right out of college uh, right out of grad school um as a venture capitalist <laughs> first of all you don't need to call me mr jeff is fine um not right at this moment but we should definitely stay in touch um we um we might uh have some interns work for us um over the summers and things like that but probably not until we raise the next fund in a few years but we would definitely love to stay in touch with you. Um, I, you. Add, I added you on LinkedIn, so I can uh, probably message you. I mean, you don't have to reply back, but thank you so much for um, um, offering that opportunity. Yeah, our, our goal is to build PFT Ventures into a big, bigger franchise. And the way it works in venture capital is, um, fund one, uh, no matter where you came from, or is always a little bit smaller. So we'll. Fund one will probably cap out at around 130 or 140 million, you know, assets under management. And that's really good for a first time. Fund. And then once you successfully show that you can do well, you can raise bigger and bigger funds. But what I would tell you, if somebody magically gave me a billion dollars to invest, I could deploy it in AI right now. And you could say, well, Jeff, you had, you had billions of dollars on the balance sheet of NVIDIA, but it's still different. It's still different. There's a, there's a nimbleness to being your own firm that's going to allow me to see and do things that I never did. So I'm I'm extremely I I'm actually the most grateful person in the, in the world for the experiences that I've had because and and this is why it's so important to use your time wisely because imagine like it could have gone differently and imagine Nvidia is out of business now. And I spent 20 years and I made a wrong decision. I, not only did I make the wrong decision, I spent 20 years and didn't understand, didn't, 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 didn't fix it. That's a really big opportunity cost for, you know, one's, one's lifetime. So I think as, if I was, if I was what you guys are, are, are looking at, I, I, tr I tr be really, really careful with where you spend your time, who, you, who, who you work with, like, who you who you allow to mentor you? I don't, it's like this in the U.S. I mean, everybody wants to be a mentor, a guide, but ask that person what have they actually done? What have they experienced? Can, are, is there advice? Not not all advice is created equal. It's not it's not all valuable. And there's too many people giving bad advice in in my view. And then 
if you're going to do something and it's failing, be intellectually honest and recognize that it's failing and start something new. I mean, we did that at NVIDIA. I mean, you could say, well, Jeff, why didn't you quit in, you know, 2009, 2012? Well, I believed what we were doing was super valuable. And I saw what early indications of future success. So it would have been a big mistake for me not, not to continue doing it. But that was a big bet because it's my time. It's forget about money. If if that time, if that, if I wasted that time, I could have been doing something else. So that that's kind of how I look back at my career and my life. It's it's all about choices, you know, making the right choices and getting the right experience and being be intellectually honest, you know. If it's not like if it's not right and you know it's not right, say something and make a move. Um but but also, you know, don't 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 be foolish. I mean, don't you know? Sometimes things take a little bit of time. You know, every six months, changing job. Every one year, no, that can't be right either. You you have, you have two problems. You you either don't you know get along with people, or you you're very bad at asking questions and doing your due diligence on the company you join. Because you know, once you commit your time, it's it's hard to get out of it. And so, do the due diligence up front you know, ask the founders, you know, where, where, what have they done before? And a lot of people you have to, will, will tell you things, but, you know, as a VC, this is my job. I, I have to ask the second and third question to really, to really dig down. So anyway, sorry, I, I answered your question and I gave you some more information, but ho hopefully that's helpful. Much. So I think, Thanks. yeah, I think we have some uh, little questions on the chat, but I think uh, we can skip that uh, and maybe uh, this is time to end this session. Uh, we really appreciate your invaluable advice as well as, uh, you know, sharing your journey, you know, uh, you know, which is really unique uh, in the world. And uh, uh, we, we hope to see you in, in person. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether you're coming to uh, Korea soon, but maybe in July or uh, I don't know. But no, uh, I'm not mm -hmm. going to be there in July. I know Jay mm -hmm. and Jenny will be there. Unfortunately, I mm -hmm. won't be able to make it. But yeah, I'd love to come and do a follow up in person one of these days, or or over Zoom. I'm happy, and hopefully, I'll right. see you when you're here uh, on the uh, 20th of June. Right. Right. Yeah. So you, but, okay. Yeah, I actually enjoyed. I, it's rare that I get to talk. You you asked me such good questions, and we didn't really talk about it too much before. But the way you kind of brought the timeline through was was great. So I uh, really appreciate. It. And ho hopefully, I've been helpful. And I mean, I I would also say like I don't know. I actually don't know everything. I know enough <laughs> to know. I know enough to know that there's a lot I don't know. I know what I don't know, and that that's actually helped me a lot. Like, just understand what I'm good at and what I do know, but realize there's just a lot of unknowns and, you know, enjoy the unknowns, you know, and not knowing what's going to happen is kind of enjoyable, you know? Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. You, even your last statement. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, see you, you. Uh, in the Palo Alto. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.